Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown, and this is another episode of Interfaith Issues. Today I'm going to be discussing the religious mystery of the crucifixion. Now, the reason I call it a mystery is because there are serious questions regarding the crucifixion. I know that that will meet with a certain uh, resistance on the part of much of the audience because the crucifixion has been accepted for such a long period of time that it's difficult to conceive of the possibility that it may never have happened or it may not have happened in the way we imagine it to have happened. But that is what we're going to be exploring today. In a previous episode, I discussed the concept of original sin and showed how the concept of original sin did not exist in Judaism. It does not exist in Islam. In fact, it does not even exist in Eastern Christianity. So we have a bit of a problem here because if, if there were such a thing as original sin, it would have existed in mankind in all ages. The Jews would not have denied it. The Jews would have believed in it because it would have been part of their scripture. Uh, the Eastern Christians have no reason to deny it unless they do not find scriptural validation for it. But to, to leapfrog from that talk to this, we have to examine the concept of the crucifixion. Now, why do I mention original sin in the context of crucifixion? One very simple reason. If there were no original sin, what would be the need for a crucifixion according to Christian theology? It's a thought that everybody has to consider. Graham Stanton, one of the leading scholars of the New Testament, is quoted as having written, and I will quote directly here, the Gospels, unlike most Greco-Roman writings, are anonymous. The familiar headings which give the name of an author, the Gospel according to, were not part of the original manuscripts, for they were added only early in the second century. Added by whom? We don't know. But let's forget all that. Let's forget that the Gospels were written anonymously. Let's forget that we do not know the authors, we do not know their intentions, we do not know anything about them for that matter, because we do not know who they were. Let's just look at biblical authority in a global sense. The Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible has this to say, quote, It is safe to say that there is not one sentence in the New Testament in which the manuscript tradition is wholly uniform. Remember, we have 5,700 manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament, and out of 5,700 manuscripts, you would expect to find two of them that agree in all of their particulars, but the fact of the matter is, we don't. Having 5,700 manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament we would expect to find at least two of them that agree in all of their particulars, but the fact of the matter is, we don't. The fact of the matter is that there are not even two manuscripts that agree in all of their particulars. This, of course, sheds tremendous light upon the Christian tradition because it throws the biblical authority into question. If out of 5,700 manuscripts, we cannot find two that agree in all of their particulars, what part can we trust? Bart D. Ehrman is famous for his words in this regard. 
quote, possibly it is easiest to put the matter in comparative terms. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. Whoa, hard to imagine. And how many people have been reading the Bible all their lives and conceiving it to be the Word of God? And yet, there are more differences among the manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. So, if we are going to look to the Bible to find the alleged witnesses of the crucifixion, we have to recognize that we don't know the authors of the Gospels, the manuscript tradition is not uniform, meaning it doesn't agree, there is no clear consensus on what happened. Even before the alleged crucifixion, we find contradictions. One Gospel states that Jesus Christ was dressed in a scarlet robe, another says it was purple. One gospel speaks of Jesus on the cross being given wine that contained gall. Another says it contained myrrh. One gospel tells us Jesus was crucified before the third hour. Another tells us he was crucified after the sixth hour. Now, hold on here. Before the third hour and after the sixth hour. There is no way that you can reconcile these two statements. Similarly, let's look at something that I would think anybody in attendance of the alleged crucifixion would have paid attention to perhaps more than anything else, and that is the last words of Jesus Christ. It is well known that any famous person, as he lies or she lies on their deathbed, is attended by their friends and family who hang upon their every word to capture their last words. There have been books written about the famous last words of famous people. And there's even one book by this title called Famous Last Words. The interesting thing about it is that the last words of famous people, for the most part, are, are not uh, in dispute. They are documented, and people agree upon what they said. So we would expect to find the same true in the case of Jesus Christ. We would expect that his loyal followers or whoever was at the crucifixion would have been waiting to, see, to hear his last words. What do we hear? Instead, in one gospel, we, we read that, that the last words of Jesus Christ were, it is finished. In another gospel, we read that his last words were, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now which is it? You can't have two last words. If one was said before the other, then it is no longer the last words. It's the next to last words. So we have a clear contradiction. Do we have other clear contradictions? Yes. As a matter of fact, we have a lot of them. Take the four Gospels, just for fun. Don't trust me on this, just for fun. Take the four Gospels, line them up parallel to one another, and read the history that is recorded regarding what happened after the alleged crucifixion. But let me make it easy for you. Who went to the tomb? According to Matthew, Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary. According to Mark. Mary Magdalene. Oh, look, we have a consistency. Mary and the mother of James and Salome. Now, wait a minute. They weren't mentioned by Matthew. So what does Luke say? 
who went to the tomb? The women who had come with him from Galilee. Okay, now we're talking about something completely different. And certain other women. John, Mary Magdalene. Okay, here we have four descriptions. Some consistency, some inconsistency. Why did they go to the tomb? Matthew, to see the tomb. Mark, they brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Luke, they brought spices. John, no reason given. Was there an earthquake? Matthew, yes. Mark, Luke, and John, well, they must not have been paying attention. I mean, after all, it was only an earthquake because no mention is given. All right. Did an angel descend? Matthew, yes. Mark, Luke, and John, no mention. Well, now wait a minute. We're talking about an earthquake and an angel in the Judean desert. Uh, it's not as if there are a lot of exciting events going on in that area at that point in time. Is it truly conceivable that three of the gospel authors did not notice it and only one did? That they did not notice an earthquake and an angel and there was nobody there to remind them to say, hey, hey, you left out in your writings, you left out the earthquake and the angel. By my count, it's three votes against one that it didn't happen. Matthew mentioned the earthquake and the descent of an angel. Mark, Luke, and John did not mention either one. Now, let's continue from that point. Say, ask the question, who rolled back the stone? Well, according to Matthew, the angel that he wrote about having descended. According to Mark, Luke, and John, they do not even mention who rolled back the stone. Again, they did not mention the angel to begin with. Um, who was at the tomb? Well, now it gets even more problematic. Matthew, an angel. Mark, a young man. Luke, two men. John, two angels. Wait a minute. One says a man, another says two men. One says an angel, another says two angels. No consensus whatsoever. Where were they? Matthew. The angel was sitting on the stone outside the tomb. The one angel was sitting on the stone outside the tomb. Mark. The young man, no longer an angel, this time a young man, was in the tomb, no longer outside, as in Matthew. Now he's inside. The young man was in the tomb, sitting on the right side. Luke. The two men, well, okay, it's jumped from one to two. The two men were inside the tomb, standing beside him. John, the two angels were sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. What do we find? Again, we find the Gospels, they cannot ag agree on whether they were men or whether they were angels. They cannot agree on whether there was one or whether there were two. They cannot agree on whether they were outside the tomb or inside the tomb. They cannot agree when they were inside the tomb on where they were in relation to Jesus Christ. By whom and where was Jesus first seen after the alleged resurrection? Matthew, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary on the road to tell the disciples. Fine and good. Mark. Mary Magdalene only. The other Mary is not mentioned here. No mention where he was seen. Luke, two of the disciples. Okay, suddenly Mary and the other Mary are completely out of the picture. Who saw Jesus allegedly after the resurrection? Two of the disciples, en route to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. A very detailed description. So, John? Does he match that description? No. With John, we're back to Mary Magdalene, not seven miles away, but outside the tomb. Well, how, how do we rectify this disagreement? How do we take four Gospels, each one of which is held up as being the Word of God or the inspired Word of God, 
each one of which is held up as being a respectable historical record. But now we know, according to modern Christian scholarship, that all four of the Gospels are anonymous, that the manuscript authority is in significant question, and we see from the evidence that they do not agree. They do not agree on the simplest points. They do not agree on the, the points that you would, you would expect would be obvious, clear, bold in front of the author's eyes, such as an angel, an earthquake, who were the first people to see Jesus Christ, and where. I mean, imagine, allegedly there's a resurrection. Allegedly, Jesus Christ comes back from the dead. Can we imagine that there was not somebody, the first person who saw him, running through the streets, announcing the fact that everybody would recognize that this was the person? This was the first one to have seen uh, Jesus Christ risen? I mean, by comparison, the Muslims celebrate the month of Ramadan with fasting. We fast the month of Ramadan. The Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar. So the beginning of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan are determined by the sighting of the moon. Okay? The sighting of the moon at the end of Ramadan ends the fasting, begins the Eid, and is a time of celebration. The first person who sights the moon becomes a hero in the community. You know, they are instantly known because that, that person, the first person who sights the moon, is the person upon whose authority the celebration is going to begin. And you cannot tell me that somebody believing that they are seeing the resurrected Jesus Christ would not feel that that was a cause of celebration. And yet, every Muslim community knows the first person to sight the moon at the end of Ramadan, but we don't know from the Gospels who was the first person to have sighted Jesus Christ after the alleged resurrection. Well, there are even deeper questions. If you want to look into it more deeply, we have raised the issue of the concept of original sin and the fact that there is no scriptural evidence to, to validate the concept of the original sin. Jesus Christ clearly did not teach it because he told his disciples not to forbid the children to come unto him because for of thine is the kingdom of heaven. Well, how can for of thine be the kingdom of heaven if they bear the taint of original sin? We also know that Jesus Christ was a rabbi, as I have said many times. He followed Old Testament law in which we find in Ezekiel the statement that the father shall not bear the sin of the son, the son shall not bear the sin of the father. Well, it's very clear. If the Son will not bear the sin of the Father, how can any sin be inherited? If the concept of original sin cannot be validated, for what purpose is the crucifixion? The claim is that God needed a sacrifice to atone for the sins of mankind. But in Hosea 6.6, 6, we find allegedly the words of God, quote, I desire mercy and not sacrifice and not 
sacrifice. This teaching is Old Testament, but you know what? It's repeated in the New Testament, Matthew 9, 13. So why then do the Christians teach that Jesus Christ needed to be sacrificed when God himself conveys that he wants mercy, not sacrifice? In Hebrews 5, 7, we find a rather long quote, but one that is very important. Quote, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Again, Hebrews 5, 7. What does it mean he was heard? because of his reverent submission? Does it not mean God answered his prayer? Because anything else would not make sense. It says, because of his reverent submission, could it possibly mean God denied his prayer because of his reverent submission? Of course not. And what was Jesus Christ praying at that time? He was praying to be saved. He was praying to be spared. And we are told in Hebrews 5, 7, God answered his prayer. If this suggests that Jesus Christ was not crucified in the first place, this will have to reset our entire view of Christianity and the concept of redemption, the concept of atonement. These are important topics, and we hope to discuss them in another episode. We hope to get to that point. For now, I would say that I have raised a lot of issues, and I would remind everybody viewing, if you have further questions, please go to my websites, www.leveltruth.com. That's Level Truth, L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H. And if you want an action adventure, something fun to read, something that you will enjoy, go to www.8thscroll.com. That's 8th, E-I-G-H-T-H, scroll, S-C-R-O-L-L, dot com. The 8th Scroll is an action-adventure book written about the Dead Sea Scrolls, set in the Holy Land. It's a very fast-paced action. I think everybody will enjoy it. At the same time that it's an action adventure, it brings into play the uh, dynamics of Christianity and Islam. So I invite everybody to explore these issues further through my books, through my websites, through, uh, through other educational avenues. I thank you very much for joining me again on this episode of Interfaith Issues. Look forward to seeing you next time.